Hello, and thank you so much for joining us for the video series titled Teaching and Learning Evidence-Based Relationships, Interviews with the Experts. This project is brought to you from the Society for the Advancement of Psychotherapy, APA Division 29, and is a companion project to the third edition of Psychotherapy Relationships That Work. The overall goal of the project is to translate relationship research to teaching and learning from the classroom context to clinical supervision. My name is Dr. Raina Markin, and today we are very fortunate to be joined by Dr. Gary Burlingham, who's a professor of clinical psychology at Brigham Young University, where he's been teaching and conducting research on group psychotherapy for over 20 years. The topic of today's discussion is how to translate research on cohesion in group therapy to teaching and training. Thank you so much for joining us, Gary. My pleasure, Raina. I guess to start off, it would be helpful if you could just define for us what group cohesion is, uh, maybe how you explain it to your students, um, how it differs maybe from some of the other constructs that it might get confused for sometimes. Sure. So uh, groups are a little more compl complicated uh, when it comes to relationship considerations. And, you know, probably for at least the last 40 years or so, one way that we've defined uh, the relationship, and I'm going to use relationship and cohesion together in sort of a, an interchangeable way, is by the structures. Uh, so uh, if I'm doing individual therapy, I have a single kind of structure, me and my uh, patient. But in group, uh, we have three main ones, member-to-member uh, -member relationships, member-to-leader relationships, and then member-to-group relationships. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's one way we define it, is the structure. What, what am I looking at? What am I observing? Who, who am I measuring? And then there are two main qualitative uh, ways of defining the relationship. One is this real common affective, uh, you know, the bond. Uh, of course, that's bipolar, positive and negative. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other, uh, a little bit like the working alliance inventory in group, uh, the tasks, you know, the work of the group. So, uh, so structure and then the qualitative uh, dimension would be the t way that we typically define uh, mm -hmm. relationship in group. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, and I think too, you know, just with students help, that's such a basic part of group training is having them look at those different levels in a group, right? Like the relationship is on a dyadic level between many different dyads and on the group level. Um, so just kind of, even the very definition as you explain it of the relationship in group therapy kind of mirrors that I think important part of group training. Yeah, and you know, another thing that uh, I think I probably do in my first class when I teach the group is, uh, and this takes a little bit of the heat off the students when it comes to relationships, is um, we talk about the group as the vehicle of change. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We talk about the member interaction uh, as the mechanism of change. Uh, and then we say, well, where do you fit in? Well, you're an indirect agent of change. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not all about you. Yes. <laughs> uh, you know, you can pay attention to small group dynamics. Yeah. Uh, and your job is maybe to know what those small group dynamics are and what a healthy dynamic looks like and an unhealthy one. And then, then we can tie interventions in that help them. So, uh, so they, that helps a little bit when it comes to relationship. You don't have to bond with every group member in the same way. So it takes a little heat off the group leader. Does that make sense? Yeah. No, I think that's what I try to communicate to students is I think in my, as a practitioner, when I work with groups and couples, it's a different stance. It's about facilitating the relationships with them. And it's my relationship with them is so important, but I'm not as important, right? <laughs> like it's, right. It's, it's about facilitating their relationships with each other. Whereas when it's just an individual therapy and it's me and, the, and one other person, then it's more in the, our relationship, I'm more in the foreground than the background. It's a very different stance, I think. Yeah, and it kind of relates to control, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, because in individual therapy, I've got more responsibility and in a group, if I think of myself as sort of an indirect agent of change, 
even if it feels a little bit out of control, which a lot of people don't like about group because groups can feel a little out of control. Uh, then, you know, it's not, I need to control this, but how can I then use the group and the subgroups that are in front of me to sort of manage the dynamic that I see? Does that make sense? Yeah, that's a great, that's a great point. Very important. Um, yeah. So I guess kind of, you know, looking at it from the results of your recent meta-analysis, I mean, can you briefly describe just sort of the main findings that you found in this meta-analysis with group cohesion? Yeah, so uh, last time, I think our last meta-analysis, we had 40 studies. Uh, this meta-analysis, uh, we added 15 new studies. Uh, the aggregate effect size uh, was exactly the same uh, within a point. Uh, so we went from point, to, uh, it was a weighted correlation coefficient. Uh, so we went from 0.25 to 0.26. What that means in English, in effect size terms, that's a moderate effect. So the relationship uh, in group treatment predicts patient improvement at the same level as it does in individual therapy. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we used uh, all, we didn't separate out the measures by different structures and, you know, the, the definition I just gave you, we just kind of, you know, uh, threw everything in. Uh -huh. uh, we don't have enough data to really tease it apart in a refined way. Uh, and then uh, the thing that we found, we tested 20 moderators, uh, you know, study moderators, member moderators, leader moderators, uh, group moderators. And we replicated for the most part what we found last time, uh, which is a study doesn't matter. So this is a consistent kind of finding across time. Uh, member characteristics for the most part don't predict. Uh, theoretical orientation was a significant moderator, uh, but um, irrespective of theoretical orientation, uh, there's still a significant relationship, whether you're a CBT person or an interpersonal. Uh, the interpersonal has higher correlations, mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, you know, the other um, theoretic orientations are still right around 0 0.2, 2, 2, 3, something like that. So it's not really clinically different. Mm -hmm. uh, but the biggest one is always the group uh, with respect to the number of moderators. Uh, so as my group it extends in time, uh, so a lot of groups, you know, are eight or 10 sessions and, so, you know, there's another chunk of groups that are in that 10 to 20 session range. And then we had groups that went as long as 50 sessions. So the more time members spend together, the larger the correlation coefficient. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, what's interesting to me is uh, the type of group doesn't matter. Hmm. So if, you're, uh, if you think, well, this cohesion is most important for therapy groups, you're wrong. Because hmm. therapy groups, psychoeducational groups, support groups, all throw real similar kinds of uh, uh, predictive relationships between cohesion and outcome. Um, and what we found last time, and we didn't find this time, was uh, that there was a sweet spot uh, with respect to the number of members. Last time we found it to be five to nine, uh, produced the largest correlation, but we actually found even groups with even smaller number of members were indistinguishable from that five to nine range. And, uh, so, so I guess the story there is, is this is a kind of, universal evidence-based principle across theoretic orientations and types of groups and sizes of groups. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So guess, given these findings, I mean, how do you approach training graduate students and how to be competent in facilitating group cohesion? So uh, this is a long answer, but we'll try to hit a few. It's a complicated question, so. Yeah, it is. So uh, the, I guess the first thing is for them to uh, really notice, uh, let's start with something easy, well, to me it's, it's easier to get your mind around. What 
relationship was, am I looking at? Am I looking at my relationship uh, with individual members as a group leader? Am I looking at uh, the, uh, a member's relationship with the group or uh, subgroups, you know, what we would call member to member uh, relationships? So we let them know that there's a level of complexity, uh, you know, that really they need to pay attention to. Uh, so this get back to composition, right? You know, the sort of Noah's Ark principle. Uh, you try not to put uh, just uh, uh, a, uh, one person who has certain characteristics in a group. You always try to have at least two uh -huh. uh, or more uh, so that you can create uh, some similarity between group members. Mm -hmm. uh, so the group may be more diverse, but you at least have a few members that look like each other. So that could be gender, it could be race, it could be any number, it could be diagnosed diagnostic considerations. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that has to do with kind of things you think about when you're putting together a group. Yeah, because you gotta, you, you gotta be thinking relationship structure. If the relationship is the best predictor, which it is, of outcome and group, not theoretical orientation, uh, then how you select and compose groups uh, becomes pretty important. And we do have selection measures now. Uh, to help in uh, defining who might be a better member uh, than another member for a group. And, th and then how do we compose a pool of members that I've selected for a particular group? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so that's one thing we look at. And then um, most, co most cohesion or relationship measures, I, uh, I alluded to this a moment ago, have positive affective pieces to them and negative affective pieces to them. So we teach them a little bit to, to not be afraid of conflict. You know, uh, so, uh, you know, if you go back to Roy McKenzie's measure, the group climate questionnaire, which is the most frequently used measure. Yeah. <laughs> he's got a, con a conflict scale in there. And the literature shows that uh, peaks and conflict actually are related uh, to good outcome. Uh, so, uh, you know, they, they don't, we teach group leaders when it comes to relationship is they don't necessarily have to be peacemakers. Mm -hmm. uh, what they have to do is be open to uh, what might this conflict be about? And is it related to intra-member concerns or inter-member uh, dynamics. I mean, there's a richness uh, to relationship the group. It's just, you know, I, I love. Yeah, uh, this is- Does that, does that help you? Yeah, and this is something that I, I think, you know, piggybacking off of that, that's what I talk to this, I, like about conflict with students. I'll always talk about my seven-year-old who is not afraid of conflict with me at all. <laughs> she is not afraid to, you know, pick fights about anything from brushing her teeth to, you know, whatever it is, you know, about the moment. And, um, you know, part of like, it doesn't mean we don't have a good relationship. Mm -hmm. you know, what matters is that we can you know, repair the rupture, so to speak, you know, deal with the conflict. Perfect. And it's something that she needs to learn too, that kids need to learn that we can have a fight and that there's not going to be, we're not going to fall apart or in the group context, the group isn't going to fall apart. Um, but that, that's part of relationships. Conflict is part of relationships. Right. And it might also be related to the theoretical model, the formal change theory that you're using in the group. Mm -hmm. So for instance, I've done a lot of work in trauma groups. Mm -hmm. and there are certain topics uh, where the task of the group, remember I said in, co in cohesion, we have both the relational, the affective definition, but mm -hmm. we also have the task definition. So uh, there may be uh, some tasks that you're asking the group and members in the group uh, to deal with that are gonna be more affectively laden. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so mo most recently our team has been working on compassion focused group treatment, this international collaboration. Uh, and there are certain pieces of that protocol that you can just predict 
are going to be tough for group members. Mm -hmm. So you, you can take uh, what we would call a universal principle, you know, the relationship, and then ask my students to think about how uh, that might play out with respect to the protocol that they're using, yeah. uh, the ask that you're asking group members. Yeah. That makes sense? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and you could actually, you know, I've worked with uh, different teams in the past to switch tasks around so that uh, maybe the first few sessions you're laying a foundation uh, of cohesion and bonding that then will allow you to get away with tougher tasks a little bit later in the protocol. Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So really kind of emphasizing with students, building cohesion early on, but then also sort of helping them feel comfortable with conflict that arises in the group and even maybe using that to build cohesion even further and deeper. Right, to help them understand. Maybe the reason that you're feeling like you want to rip my face off as a group leader is because I'm asking you to look at something that's pretty hard. Yeah. Uh, and good job that you're allowing yourself to have those feelings yeah. uh, because that means you're doing the work of the group. Yeah. Uh, and so you bring it back to the individual member goals and the group goals uh, that you started with to begin with. Mm -hmm. Hopefully in your pre preparation that you do with your members. Absolutely. Yeah, does that help? Yep, yep, that's very helpful. Um, so are there sort of when you train graduate students in group cohesion, are there um, readings, websites, videos that you use as resources? Yeah, um, probably the first thing that I do before I get there uh, is I expose them to measures, uh -huh. uh, you know, and uh, uh, the, the latest uh, uh, meta-analysis that we did uh, showed uh, something different on measures of relationship, and that was that they were not different. There's about a handful, about five measures. Uh, that uh, are used pretty frequently, maybe five times or more. McKenzie's measure is the most frequently used, 16. Uh, so that they can get an idea of how they might want to define or at least monitor a relationship. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then you can match it to, uh, you know, uh, types of groups. So, that, of course, we use the Yalom tapes. Uh -huh. uh, you know, which have been around for a long time. Uh, a lot of our students, we have a VA uh, center uh, not far from our uh, university. Uh, the v has, VA has produced some nice uh, videos, uh, so uh, we tailor it to the clinical population. One of our labs um, uh, that we collect data out of is a, a large counseling center. We have about 50 psychologists that work out of it and about 30 groups. Uh, so, uh, there are some, uh, videos that kind of are tied more to the counseling center world. Uh, so, uh, what I try to do when I bring my students in is I ask them to get clear on the type of group they want to become a specialist in, and then we try to target, uh, uh, groups and videos accordingly, uh, so that, uh, we we catch their attention so we're not showing them something that's boring uh -huh. <laughs> related to their interests. Does that make sense? Uh -huh. And I think probably people are, are familiar with the Yalom videos They're and they're pretty easy to find and accessible. Um, how, how do people, you mentioned counseling center videos and VA videos, do you know, how do people kind of come across those to use? Yeah, I just have, you know, I've been at this for so many decades. I just have been collecting them. Uh, so uh, the way that I've come across them is like, like the VA, let's use that as an example, um, uh, partly because of demand, uh, you know, use a lot of groups. Uh, and so uh, one of the- I in graduate school with VA. <laughs> okay, so you know that. Uh, and so one of the videos that I make, one of the videos that uh, uh, different VA systems have developed is preparing group members. Uh, yeah. Uh, 
And uh, so the VA is a big trauma uh, treatment program. And so, uh, you know, a part gets back to what I said a moment ago, a part is getting clear on what you're interested in because, you know, the group literature can be found in over 300 journals. Yeah. Uh, and so you'll get overwhelmed you know, if you don't get clear on what you want to focus on. Mm -hmm. Counseling centers have done the same thing. Uh, counseling centers, uh, if you look at the empirical group literature, counseling centers have contributed a ton to the empirical group literature. Uh, and they similarly, may, maybe they're focusing on uh, mood disorders or eating disorders. You can find resources simply by getting clear in the population and then tapping into uh, resources. So for instance, in counseling centers, Josh Gross, um, I, think, I think it's Ann McEnany, there's a few counseling center people who have this massive uh, listserv uh, of group coordinators, I think four, five, 600 group coordinators. Uh, and if you're interested in something, you just get on that listserv and say, who has this? Yeah. Are you familiar with that listserv? Or? Those kinds of listservs are great because somebody will have it. <laughs> yeah. And it can be yeah. a great resource. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's kind of how I get, you know, I've got my own little library, but we also kind of help people get clear on what they're interested in. Yeah. And you mentioned, I think, five different popular measures. Um, do you kind of Bring, use these measures either in the classroom or encourage students to use them in session with clients? Yes, uh, to both of those. So uh, we uh, had this international team, uh, you know, that we started developing about 20 years ago with Bernard Strauss in um, uh, Germany, but he's got his lab covers Switzerland and a few other countries and so we have our own measure of relationship called the group questionnaire. So I expose my students to that. I'll tell you about that in a second. Uh, I also, the, the GQ is a little longer, so I also expose them to short measures. Uh, so, uh, or shorter. Uh, so Roy McKenzie's measure, uh, you know, is, uh, you know, the winner, if you want to count the number of studies. So they leave my class uh, with three to five measures in their hands uh -huh. that capture the relationship. Mm -hmm. Then I, I expose to them what the literature is on each of those. Uh, the, the strongest literature uh, is uh, going to be associated with Roy's measure. How to interpret uh, scores on those measures, uh, as well as the GQ, because the GQ is an amalgam of several different measures. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and uh, in our uh, training program, uh, uh, both in the clinical program as well as the counseling program, students who are taking a group course have a parallel experiential group uh, that they're uh, uh, a part of. And so we use the measures on their own group so they get to not only learn about it as a group leader, but also they take it themselves as a member of a group so they can get a feel of what that's like, mm -hmm. as, you know, when they're rating their own group. Does that make sense? Right. Yep. 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 Um, but yeah, so uh, uh, they leave uh, with uh, what I call a toolkit. Yeah. Yeah. No, and I think it's really helpful for students to have those sort of concrete, tangible tools in their toolkit. Yeah. Yeah. So what are some of the most common challenges you encounter when training students on facilitating group cohesion and how do you, you know, approach those challenges with students? Right. Uh, this is where we talk for an hour, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, yeah. Let me hit a high point or two. Uh, one is, um, you know, in our, most graduate programs, you know, we select, you know, the cream of the crop uh, and, in clinical and counseling programs that are APA approved, we're generally picking students that have been successful with research. Uh, so to be successful at research, you gotta have a certain kind of personality characteristic, uh, you know, where you, you can, you know, you've done an experiment, you've had control over that experiment, you've had control when you're doing your data analysis. So you notice I'm using the word control. Uh, 
And almost without exception, uh, the most common fear is being out of control uh, with our uh, beginning students. And uh, one of the ways that they can stay in control is they have a protocol and there. I've seen students actually read in their group right out of the protocol. You know, let me be, I'm gonna be really in control here. Uh, well, that's kind of sad, right? Uh, but it's predictable. So a part of, a part of this uh, training that we do is we do a little bit of discussion around control and then we link it back to what I said a moment ago about, uh, well, how important are you really? Uh, and maybe you're not as important as you think. And uh, kind of link it back to the empirical literature that I shared a minute ago about the power of the group and the relationships in the group. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Um, for students coming in who personality-wise are very achievement-oriented, that's a strength of theirs and it's been very adaptive for them in many contexts. Um, but achievement means something different sometimes as a group therapist. Right, you gotta let the group uh, be organic uh, sometimes, even if it's a psycho-ed group mm -hmm. and you've just delivered some information or you've just practiced a skill. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they gotta take it home. Uh, which means they got to make it their own, which means you got to let go and then let the group organically struggle with whatever you just taught them. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that, that means you're out of control if yeah. you let it go, yeah. right? But I think too, like helping students see the, the positive of that, that sometimes it can feel good to let go of that control. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that that doesn't have to be a negative thing, that that can feel good sometimes. Yeah. It can feel good to watch group members have healing interactions just between the two of them, that that can feel good. Yeah, yeah. And you know, uh, a sneaky thing that I think we do, uh, you know, still on this control, is our lab, uh, probably for about 20 years now, uh, has been trying uh, different strategies to monitor the relationship on a session by session basis. Mm -hmm. uh, and being able to interpret patterns of relationship change in the group as a whole, as well as subgroups and individual members. And the reason I say it's sneaky is because I say if you want control, just try to get your members to give you data on how they're feeling about the relationship. Mm -hmm. And then let your control focus on understanding the yeah. dynamics. So um, Yvonne Gazarian's model of subgrouping, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, SCT, system-centered therapy. You can see relationship patterns occur across different measures, the GQ, Roy's measure, and whatnot. And then the group leaders can understand, well, I've got a subgroup developing over here. Uh, half of my group is really happy, but I got a group over here that, you know, are experiencing conflict, low engagement and bond. Uh, so I said, if you want to control something, control your monitoring of the group and then let that guide your clinical interventions. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, that's a very helpful, I think, reframe, um, because it's not asking someone to give up control per se, but to refocus it. Yeah. You know, something they actually may have some control over, which is their own understanding, their own observation. And let themselves be surprised, because one of the things that happens is when you monitor uh, and you listen to the client's voice, you're, you're wrong sometimes. You're gonna be surprised by what they tell you. Um, which leads me to another thing that we do when we treat them. Uh, we've been, uh, so Mike Lambert and I in 1990 uh, developed the OQ, the outcome questionnaire, and then a year or two later, we developed the youth outcome questionnaire. Uh, so I've been in the outcome monitoring uh, literature now for about 30 years. Uh, so about uh, 20 years ago, when Mike started to develop uh, clinical support tools for individual therapy, mm -hmm. we started to develop clinical support tools for group therapy. 
Uh, and so we just finished, there was a special issue of psychotherapy that just came out in, um, I think June of 18, uh, uh, that was all devoted to monitoring uh, the, uh, uh, the, the relationship and outcome uh, in group treatment. Uh, and uh, we did an RCT in that, uh, uh, we reported on an uh, uh, RCT that we did in that special issue. Mm -hmm. showing that giving group leaders feedback about uh, where their members are at on the relationship spectrum. Mm -hmm. And we have three dimensions, positive bond, what we call negative relationship, or really think conflict, uh -huh. uh, and, and the, how much they feel the group is helping them work or solve their goals, address their goals. Mm -hmm giving them feedback, letting them know when their members are deteriorating on those three dimensions, uh, allows those group leaders within two sessions to reverse the course. And we used it within subject design, so group leaders ran two parallel groups. Both groups were monitored, mm -hmm. but we only gave them relationship feedback in one. Huh. Uh, and so we were comparing group leader with themselves and we found that feedback on the relationship and group treatment uh, can actually allow the group leader to shift. Um, and uh, so that's another thing I teach my students, uh, which is, you know, monitoring allows you to actually shift, have some interventions that allow you to shift. So if your group is not feeling like they're getting any work done, go in and talk to them. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I, I notice that people aren't feeling like we're meeting our goals. How would you know that? You got to monitor. Uh -huh. uh, or if there's conflict that's higher than what you think, that monitoring will allow you to know that and then you can go in and, and address it either explicitly or indirectly in the group. Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's another way of giving group leaders control or yeah. sort of control. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 And one of the things that we did in that special issue is we had a couple of doctoral students at, from BYU do a qualitative study. I can't remember, Rena, you know, hundreds of therapist interventions uh -huh. uh, that they used as a result of getting feedback and then we did a content analysis and gave about a dozen main categories that most group leaders uh, use uh, when they're giving feedback or given feedback from the monitoring system. So now what we do is we use that. That's very organic because it came from uh, group leaders. Here's the feedback and here's what uh, 16 other group leaders did when they received that feedback. Hmm. And were there Sorry. specific interventions um, in that specifically to facilitate group cohesion? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, maybe about 20 years ago, we developed uh, what we fondly refer to as the Jeepers, mm -hmm. uh, the Psychotherapy Intervention Rating Scale. So we've got, uh, those are evidence-based, that came from John's first edition. Mm -hmm. Uh, of the of this book uh, where we just listed interventions associated with improving cohesion uh -huh. so we've linked those interventions back to the GQ uh, and uh, what leaders are saying they're kind of classes of interventions so uh, how might I uh, uh, consider uh, rupture uh, addressing rupture uh -huh. well, maybe it differs and if it's a rupture with the leader versus rupture between two members yeah. or a member in the group. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. But I think those very specific interventions are, are helpful to beginning students. Um, I mean, I guess the, the danger is in sort of students feeling like they have to follow this script, right? But I mean, having some some example to go from there and make their own, I think is really helpful for beginning students or else it just all feels too abstract. Right. Especially if they haven't been in a group, run a group, it's just sort of, 
All right, up here. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, so what do you think are some of the important lessons that we need to take from this, um, from this work that you've done as psychotherapy trainers and supervisors? What are our take home messages? Well, um, I think it's one of the take home messages in our chapter and group is the same as the theme that comes out of, uh, you know, the entire volume that, uh, John uh, has added it again, John and Mike, I guess, in the first volume. Um, and that is uh, that uh, the relationship and group treatment is solidly, can be solidly considered to be an evidence-based practice. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, you need to look at your own, uh, you know, strengths. Mm -hmm as a group leader, uh, as well as things you might be afraid of or limitations. Um, and uh, uh, when we train group leaders, um, we train them at, with a co-leader, uh, generally a senior. Uh, so we talk about uh, how to use your co-leader uh, to help you offset some of your own limitations, you know, either technical skills, uh, you know, or relational management. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the biggest take home message uh, is that. And then we quickly add, uh, you know, what I shared a moment ago, which is uh, this is universal across different types of groups. This is universal across different types of theoretical orientations. Uh, it happens in parent groups. It happens in kid groups. Uh, so, uh, in a way, it's kind of a real simple take-home message, Reina. Yeah. You know, yeah. I can bang that in. Uh, that then gives enough, because monitoring takes a little bit of work, right? Yeah, it takes a lot of work sometimes. Uh, uh, well, if you use a computer system, it's easier. Um, and um, uh, you got to convince them that the benefit of paying attention to the relationship uh, it, you know, outweighs any of the logistical challenges. Yeah, yeah. I think, um, you know, it's like something that we talk about in my group classes. I think it's a hum fundamental human um, desire to belong. Now, some of us might, that's not always easy to actualize because of our own history sometimes, but I, it's a fundamental desire to belong. <laughs> and, you yeah. know, where else can you really get that satisfied or if you have conflict around that work through than in group? And in that paradigm, cohesion is, it's the, you know, it's the bread and butter. It's, Right. The foreground, the background, side ground, you know, it's, it becomes really essential. <laughs> yeah. And one of the things that we model for the students, you know, just on your point, is how to begin to recruit their group members to monitoring uh, while they're doing their pre-group uh, intake. And, and we had them say something very similar to what you just said, which is, uh, there's going to be two parts of this group, just like if you were in a class uh, at the university. There's going to be the work of the group, uh, but how the group feels is a lot like how maybe a class that you've taken feels. And you're the one who's going to be able to give us that information. Mm -hmm. uh, so we model, uh, the, you know, how we as leaders tell our group members at the end of the group, I'm leaving and I'm going to take 10 minutes and write case notes. Would you be willing to take three minutes and fill out a little form on how this group's going for you? We're going to ask you how it's going for you from a bond perspective and how it's going for you from a work perspective. Mm -hmm. So does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Well, thank you very much for sharing your expertise in this area. I think it's a really important area and um, I think it'll be very useful to group psychotherapy trainers, supervisors, and students. So thank you so much. My pleasure.